what is the problem with the, uh, with the Trump foreign policy? Good Lord, what isn't the problem <laughs> with the Trump foreign policy? I mean, there are people, there are people who, who, you know, who claim to see um, you know, smart things that the man has done. And, uh, and I, I, can't, I can't really argue with that too much because it isn't like the previous eight years were just hunky-dunky. I mean, the, the eight years of the Obama foreign policy were something less than, um, less than pleasing to me. So, I mean, e even an analog, a broken analog clock is, ri is right twice a day, right? So you're going to have to ac even accidentally do something right uh, once in a while. So, for example, uh, uh, well, no, I'm not even going to go into examples because I'll end up um, uh, getting getting too long with what I want to say. But yeah, there have been some things that, that the, the Trump administration has done, usually for the wrong reasons or for reasons not understood, but it turned out okay. Uh, but most, mostly it's been, it's been a disaster, it seems to me. And uh, what's happened just in the past few days with, uh, uh, along the, uh, the Turkish-Syrian border and this spectacle you know, of uh, telephone calls and so forth and telling uh, President Erdogan, oh yeah, go right in, but if you go too far, right, I'll, I'll trash your account. Oh, this kind of stuff, right? This is not normal. Uh, anybody who thinks that this administration is normal hasn't been paying attention. It's anything but normal and it's been anything but pretty. However, most people in Europe anyway, and a lot of people in academia in the United States, uh, they have a theory of what's wrong with the Trump foreign policy. And I'm going to quote a, an intelligent and experienced journalist uh, just to set, it, set up what I think the majority view is of the problem with the Trump foreign policy. So I'm quoting an Israeli journalist. That's just incidental. It could be any European journalist. It could be almost any academic from most American universities. Here's the quote. In the ocean of international relations, icebergs, quote within the quote, icebergs have always popped up that threatened the post-World War II world order and sought to dictate an order based on force rather than decisions by the international community as expressed in UN conventions on issues like occupied territory, human rights, nuclear proliferation, and ballistic missiles. These icebergs, usually in the form of tyrants in Africa, Asia, and South America, have largely melted in the warm currents of the international community under the leadership of the United States and Western Europe. This has happened even though these leaders, too, sometimes sinned by using arbitrary force. Ellipses. Yeah. Donald Trump's shirking of the U.S. commitment to the international community's Gulf Stream once again leaves international relations to the forces of aggression. The Trump administration even switched sides and became a giant iceberg, threatening an ice age on the existing order, which is based on the lessons from the world wars. Close quote. This is the sort of stuff you hear all the time. I mean, very recently, just recently, uh, the German and the French foreign ministers, based on an article that they had written back in February, have created something now they now call the multilateral alliance. And if you try to read what this is, this is supposed to be about, there's a lot of words in it, but it's not exactly easy to figure out what it is that they're really getting at. And even though they don't mention the United States directly uh, in, in the verbiage, you sort of get the impression that the problem is the United States returning to great power competition, right? And that what the United States should be doing is not uh, exercising or thinking about power uh, visa uh, revisionist states, what the United States considers to be revisionist states in the international community, but rather should be trying to find rules-based ways of ameliorating conflicts and so forth and so on. So if you look into this document and you ask, well, is it going to get the Russians out of Crimea and, and uh, in, from in invading eastern Ukraine? Is it going to balance China? Is it going to do anything about uh, various messes in the Middle East. These are not mentioned. These are not on the agenda at all. Uh, the only thing you can find on the agenda are, um, are items that fall, I think justifiably, under the rubric of uh, international functional problems that require multilateral uh, uh, effort to deal with them, like climate change, like the threat of pandemics, like um, uh, standards of labor and environment and trade, things like that. So, you know, all of the traditional sorts of conflicts that arise, that have arisen over, over, the, over many, many years, these, these aren't there. They just don't exist in this agenda. Only, only other kinds of things do. So you wonder just exactly what uh, this document is going to mean in practice. It probably won't mean anything except a lot more meetings. Um, I mean, if the Germans in particular wanted to really contribute to um, 
the institution that, that underwrites the security of Europe, they would put together at least one uh, military division that can actually function and help NATO. But that doesn't seem to be in the cards. So this is the sort of thinking that, that you, you hear most, most often when it comes to what's wrong with the, um, with the Trump administration. And this view, I think, fairly goes under the label of liberal internationalism. And that is the default template of what passes for um, the Western intelligentsia. And that's one reason why it's called, why, why the liberal intelligentsia is called liberal, because it takes this view, although there are also domestic uh, and cultural aspects of, uh, of liberal internationalism that also help define, define the thing. And of course, this point of view in the United States is not without many critics. There are realists, academic realists, and temperamental realists. I'm a temperamental realist, not an academic realist. I actually think ac academic realism is one of the most unrealistic ways of looking at international relations I've ever seen because you go through all these formal models and they never talk about politics. Amazing. But anyway, um, uh, and, and of course it's fair to say too that, pe that liberal internationalists come in very different flavors uh, depending on just how much they claim for the, their point of view. Um, uh, I, I forgot to mention uh, the, the uh, I forgot to mention the uh, the quote that I that I uh, started before. Um, it concludes by defining this Gulf Stream that this is really uh, this is really journalist um, um, described. And here they are: the three bases of world order: international consensus, international law, and United Nations Security Council resolutions. That's really closing the quote. I forgot that part before. So these are the things that matter to liberal internationalists, and. Um, uh, Again, whatever the variation in the point of view, I think the basic, the basic approach is fundamentally wrong. I think it's wrong because it makes a, a, a category error. It makes an ontological error. It mixes up an aspiration for what is, in fact, reality in the world. And, uh, and that's not useful um, to getting things right. Um, uh, it seems to me that not a single one of the sentences in the quote that I brought before is actually fully accurate, not one. And the error, uh, I think, uh, can be demonstrated by the logical presumption that uh, since the Obama administration in the eight years before the Trump administration did not spurn, uh, at least not actively spurn, uh, international consensus, uh, international uh, so-called community or the United Nations General Assembly, then that would have meant that everything was just fine during those eight years. But that's an, a very difficult argument to make with a straight face, it seems to me. Now, the main reason for the error, it seems to me, the, the category error of liberal internationalism is, again, that it mistakes an, a, an aspiration for a reality. And by doing so, it gets a, a fundamental chunk of causality exactly backwards. Okay? International consensus, international law, and UN Security Council resolutions have not produced the post-World War II international order and what remains of it today. They are consequences, not causes of an order produced by the advanced democracies of the West, led after 1945 by the United States, and girded by American power and reputation. In other words, these three abstract nouns are epiphenomenal of more substantive realities. And it follows that if those substantive realities change, so eventually will their downstream effluvia. Uh, so in other words, they get the ontology wrong. Now a telltale, fray, a, a telltale sign of getting cause and effect backwards is the presence of this ubiquitous phrase, international community. Uh, the international community, in my view, is to a real community what Lewis Carroll's March Hare is to a real rabbit. Uh, it is a figment of an active and tender, if well-intentioned, imagination. If you like a metaphor instead of a literary reference, international consensus, whatever exactly that is supposed to mean in practice, I mean, is that just kind of like the average of what the United Nations General Assembly uh, delegations think? Uh, it being a matter of obvious fact that most of those delegations are, uh, are not democratically accountable to anybody and that they're made up largely of um, not very nice people, let's put it that way. If the sum of those views is the international consensus, I don't know. I, uh, I'm not sure that I would like to be part of that international consensus. But like I say, if you like, if you like a, a metaphor instead of a literary reference, I would call your attention to a, a really remarkable statement that a British academic a long time ago named Charles H.W. Manning once said, he said, one does not affect the position of a shadow by doing things to the shadow, right? That, is the, that really sums up the ontological error of liberal internationalism. It tries to do things uh, uh, by, by it, it tries to 
uh, change things by by uh, by messing with shadows. It gets again, it gets it gets cause and consequence backwards. Let me just give you an example to try to try to push the point across. Uh, the Israeli fellow that I mentioned earlier mentioned in passing um, nuclear weapons proliferation, a UN convention on nuclear weapons proliferation. He means, of course, the 1967 uh, NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And it is a matter of faith, a word carefully chosen. It is a matter, it is an article of faith among liberal internationalists that the NPT has been mainly, if not exclusively, responsible for staunching nuclear weapons proliferation. Uh, a specter that back in the mid-1960s was expected to spread widely dangerously and all too quickly. Uh, and again, this is to me a typical liberal internationalist form of magical thinking, uh, of believing that shadows uh, move substance rather than the other way around. What has really staunched the proliferation demon all these years, to the extent that it's been staunched at all, is U.S. foreign and national security policy based on American military might and the reputational resolve to use it if necessary. The spread of the U.S. nuclear umbrella back in the day of the, back in the Cold War, uh, principally through its alliance structures in Europe and in Asia, protected vulnerable countries from nuclear extortion and an extremist from nuclear attack. That sharply reduced the incentives of a variety of countries to acquire their own nuclear weapons. The guarantees that were embedded in these regional alliance structures, uh, more classically multilateral in Europe, more hub and spoke like uh, in Asia, uh, also um, obviated or palliated intra-regional competitions and arms races, thus deflating further any powerful rationale for countries to acquire their own nuclear weapons. And the proof is almost too obvious to need pointing out, and Asia provides the proof text. Japan, uh, protected by a U.S. nuclear umbrella as the nuclear age evolved, did not acquire its own nuclear weapons and delivery systems, although it was well within Japan's technological capabilities to do that. India, not protected by the U.S. nuclear umbrella, and Pakistan, protected much less robustly for not being a U.S. treaty ally, did, did acquire nuclear weapons, and they did so after the signing and the ratification of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. If that doesn't make the case, I don't know what, what can. So, Am I saying that multilateral institutions like the United Nations and the associated apparatus of international law and all the norms that go along with it, am I saying that these things are completely feckless and that they don't mean anything at all? No, not at all. Of course, they can be feckless. You just take one look at the, the daily activities of the United Nations General Assembly and you can see that. But no, these are shadows of power, but they are often very useful augmentations to the suasive reality of actual force, of actual power. Norms in international relations represent the benign habituation of state behaviors originally founded on calculations of self-interest. And as such, they represent a valuable economy for those powers with an interest and an ability to shape norms. They matter to the extent that the powers which create and sustain an international order want them to matter. In other words, the extent to which they invest in the articulation and the enforcement of those norms. So the effort to maintain benign norms matters in particular when things changed. Think about the end of the Cold War, for example, 1991, 1992, back there. The normative environment at such very critical and fluid times is far short of an iron cage against the uh, against miscreants or bad actors that might be lurking around uh, on the revisionist edges, but it does set guardrails uh, for acceptable behavior. It works as a kind of Overton window uh, in the international system, if you know what that, what that phrase means. Um, and I, I would quote to you a, a very famous uh, uh, sentence from I.W. Thomas many years ago who said that if people think things are real, they think things are real, then those things are real and their consequences, right? So there's a certain kind of self-fulfilling, mythic uh, structural cap you know, uh, aspect to norms, and if they are enforced and if they are, are consistently maintained and, and maintenance, they can be very, very important features of international politics. Now, uh, let me just mention my old friend John Bolton at this point, if I might. Before I, before I told you that I actually believe that norms matter and that they are useful augmentations, of, even though they may be shadows, useful augmentations to 
more ontologically real forms of power. Before I said that, what I told you about the international community being, you know, not real, John Bolton would not have disagreed with a single word I said. Not one. All right? And I, I know this because I've known the guy for probably 30 years. But as soon as I get to the point where I answer the question, is all of this stuff just shadow and air and is it all feckless and meaningless? And I say no, it's meaningful if you understand the relationship between the ontological categories. That's where John would get off the boat. He actually believes that all this stuff is just bull. <laughs> right? So just so you should see you know, where, uh, where uh, in this case, a real personality, having had a really important job in the U.S. government, where they kind of fit into, how they slice into this kind of typology that I'm trying to, I'm trying to set for you here. So the, in the U.S. devised uh, uh, international order after World War II, the United States and its allies have invested an awful lot of energy in trying to sustain, build, maintain, and spread liberal norms, all right, uh, until lately, until the last couple of years when there's been more of a wrecking ball at work rather than uh, a constructive effort. It takes a lot of time and patience to build these kinds of norms. Uh, and the building can never cease because the international weather, so to speak, always implies deterioration in the face of any uh, protracted respite. And that really is what American retail diplomacy has been doing for the past 50 or 60 years, and rightly so. Now, it's often a thankless job. It requires uh, more than a dollop of eyewash sometimes. Uh, if you haven't actually drunk from the, the fountain of, uh, of liberal internationalism, what diplomats do when they go around the world trying to sustain these norms, most of them are quite well aware that this is a mythic, a mythic uh, exercise they're involved in and that it's not really real, but it really matters anyway. All right? And so being a US diplomat is not always a lot of fun, but you, know, you get paid and you get a pension. So all right, somebody has to do it. right? But, but again, the point I want, I'm trying to hammer home here is that, as with keeping any set of tools in good repair, norm-building exercises are auxiliary activities of powerful bodies in motion. What they produce institutionally, however useful, has no independent existence, no independent clout, no independent mine of its own. The UN Security Council, for a preeminent example, is wholly a creature of the member states that make it up. Uh, it is useful on those rare occasions when the major powers happen to have concurrent or amenable interests in a given situation. Uh, that's a useful thing. It's, but it's, so it's no less than that, but it's also no more than that. When the members of the Security Council are not in agreement, take Syria for a current example. Uh, United Nations Security Council resolutions, such as the one from about a year and a half ago, uh, against dropping barrel bombs on civilian populations all right, are meaningless. They are rendered completely meaningless. And that is especially so in a case like the one we have now where one of the members of the Security Council is doing the bombing. Think about that for a minute. Do I want to get rid of the Security Council? No. Um, do I trust it to actually solve really serious problems? No. Now, the damage caused by the Trump foreign policy, it's a tremendous damage, but it's not because Trump is not a liberal internationalist. There are other far more serious forms of damage that this, this guy and this administration uh, have done. The real problem, there are kind of two phases, well, there are three phases of it. The real problem, first of all, is that this is not an administration that understands what diplomacy seems to be. They don't know what it is, or if, they, if somebody in the administration knows what it is, they have elected not to use it, all right? The, uh, uh, most of what the president says, tweets, you know, uh, isn't really, it may seem to be about foreign policy a lot of the time, but it, it mostly isn't. These are mostly um, signals to uh, his domestic political base. It's mostly about politics not about foreign policy, which is why it seems so whimsical and, so, and so, you know, so subject to change. If you don't like the policy, wait 20 minutes. You might get it. You might hear another one. How many times has the president said, we're withdrawing from Syria? Oh, no, we're not. Oh, yes, we are. No, we're not. It makes me think of an old Jimmy Durante routine, all right? Most of you don't know about Jimmy Durante, so never mind. Um, uh, but but, but the, uh, the failure to understand what diplomacy is is pretty profound. There are only two parts of diplomacy. There are only two things that diplomacy is, all right? Most of you, I think, know this. It's either consultation or it's negotiation. 
there aren't any other options, unless you're in the middle of a war, which is thankfully not the case. Uh, this administration doesn't use diplomacy for either consultation or negotiation, except in the very limited domain of international trade, which we've seen. All right? uh, instead of negotiation or consultation, what it tends to do is make very loud, nasty noises and throw sanctions at everybody. And no, just here's a sanction, there's a sanction. You know, the president the other day was talking about Nancy Pelosi handing out subpoenas, right? Left and right, like they're cookies, he said. Well, that's what the administration does with sanctions. Throws them around like they're cookies, all right? This is not diplomacy. This is being a bully, basically. And it's not very effective uh, when you do that sort of thing. Of course, we all know that the, the, the State Department budget from the very beginning of the administration was essentially garroted. And Mr. Tillerson went in to pull the garret tight on the State Department. The budget is uh, uh, not so hot uh, lately. And people aren't taking the Foreign Service exam like they used to. And we are looking at probably two generations of a huge hole in the professional foreign service in the United States. It's going to take 30 years to fix this. It's not all Trump's fault, but, but a lot of it is. Just here in Singapore, for example, the embassy here has a complement of five foreign service officers. Okay? Typical complement in Singapore is seven or eight. So what does that mean? There's no money. That's why, you know, uh, I mean, a, a new ambassador might show up eventually. She's been nominated. I don't know what will happen. But meanwhile, the, the foreign service officers over at the embassy are burning out and going crazy because there are five people trying to do the work of eight. That's one of the consequences, local consequences, of the, the garroting of the State Department budget. So these people don't understand diplomacy, and they don't use it. And, um, but even that is not the worst thing. There are two other things that are even worse. Uh, uh, the main thing that, uh, that bothers me is that... Uh, this administration has proven to be the opposite. Take, it's, it's, it's taken the, uh, the advice of Theodore Roosevelt, turned it right on its head. What did Theodore Roosevelt say? Walk so softly, but carry a big stick. What does Donald Trump do? He runs his mouth at full volume and carries a toothpick. <laughs> this man is so risk averse that we have a situation now where the prudential but effective and judicious use of American power really doesn't exist. And I can, I'm going to give you a series of, of very quick examples to show you this. So uh, let me see if I can. Let, let's, let's start with um, I have this thing backwards. Let's start with Korea. So what's, what's been going on with North Korea? So, so the president decides he wants to have some photo ops with, uh, with uh, Rocket Man. First he calls him Rocket Man. Then he, he has a series of photo ops with uh, Kim Jong-un. And uh, Presumably, this is actually going to result in some sort of uh, serious reduction or elimination of North Korea's nuclear weapons. And of course, that's never going to happen because that's, that's, the, that's the regime's ultima ratio for, for regime survival. It took the lesson of Ukraine and Libya. Basically, if you don't have nuclear weapons, the Americans don't like you, you're screwed. If you do have nuclear weapons, you might, you might last, you might survive. And the Iranians have the same, reached the same conclusion, of course. Uh, so what's happened so far? Well, nothing's happened so far. We're not, we're not any closer to making a deal with, with North Korea. There's a deal to be had that's, that's, that's better than no loaf. It may even be a third of a loaf, but we're never going to get the North Koreans to give up their nuclear weapons. But there's, but there's a deal to be had. So when the idea of a summit was first mooted, I wasn't against it because I could think of an intelligent way to use the deep pariahization of North Korean politics to good, to good effects. And if you keep treating this guy like a pariah, then he has an incentive to act like one, right? If you stop treating him like a pariah, maybe he won't be able to, you know, to extort and blackmail the way that he and his father and his grandfather were so successful at doing. So I saw, I saw possibilities, but only if it were done right. It, but, you know, when you, it's funny, you go back, if you want some of the most um, trenchant philosophical observations about international politics, you can't beat the script from The Wizard of Oz the movie The Wizard. You really can't. I, I mean, I quote it all the time. What does the Wicked Witch say? All right. She says, these things must be done delicately. You remember the movie? Well, <laughs> it's, an, it's, it's, it's perfectly suitable here. You can do a lot, of, a lot of, it's not just what you do that matters in foreign policy, it's how you do it. All right. So the, I, I wasn't opposed to symmetry with North Korea, but, I, but it depended on what strategy it was and how it was done. These guys had no idea, apparently, of any of that stuff. So right now we have a series of photo ops that are leading absolutely nowhere. They're leading to, to acrid smoke and cracked mirrors. Smoke and mirrors is pretty much all it is. It's a spectacle. It's not diplomacy, as best I can tell. Um, uh, of course, we've already mentioned Syria briefly. So I think it was in December 2018, the president announced he was going to withdraw 
uh, all the troops we had in Syria. It's only 2,000 troops, not a lot of guys. But boy, they were positioned in a place, they, the Special Forces guys, have, we got a lot of mileage out of those 2,000 soldiers. Um, it's a long story, I don't want to get into this too much right now, we'd be here for forever. But then the, um, Secretary Mattis persuaded him that this was a really terrible idea, so he walked it back. Said he didn't, but he did. But it keeps coming, you know, you can't, you can't suppress a bad idea. They keep coming back, you know. So now, uh, in a telephone conversation with, uh, with President Erdogan, so we've now evacuated a certain section of the border anyway, and, uh, and now we have, uh, pardon, the, pardon my Greek, we have a shit show on the, on the, on the Turkish-Syrian frontier, uh, the consequences of which nobody can really know for sure right now. Um, I mean, basically, Trump acts like a bully, but like inside of every bully, there's a sissy, right? Uh, that, that, that's why the bully exists, because down under, underneath there is a sissy. And you see the risk aversion of this guy. L look at the stuff with Iran. So, uh, you know, we have uh, six tankers attacked by the IRGC in one way or another. We have a commando operation actually seized a British ship. And we have an ob the United States has an obligation taken at least since the British left east of Suez in 1971, and more formally with the Carter Doctrine in 1977-78, to protect in part of you know, the United States supplying common security goods to the, to the world. We have an obligation to keep that straight open and keep the oil flowing at reasonable prices to, to global markets. We don't need the oil anymore in the United States, but a lot of other countries do. And only somebody like Donald Trump, who is an unreconstructed Randian, who can't wrap his mind around a positive sum outcome, right, thinks that because we don't need it, then we have no interest in, pre in preserving you know, the flow of oil. Unbelievable. So the Saudis, from the Saudi point of view, the Saudis did not like the Obama administration's approach to the Middle East, right? The Saudis used to say to us all the time, you need to cut off the head of the snake. The snake, of course, being Iran. And then what does he see Obama? He see Obama's getting into bed with the snake. Not exactly what the Saudis had in mind. So along comes Trump, right? His first international trip is to Saudi Arabia, and he talks about this lunatic idea of an Arab NATO. Anybody who talks about the idea of an Arab NATO either doesn't know what NATO is or doesn't understand the Arabs, probably both. But in any event, the Saudis are delighted with this, right? Now, finally, the Americans are going to stick with us. They're going to, they're going to give it to the Iranians. We're going to, they're going to concord our power and money. We're going to, and then look what happens. Something, there's an attack, pretty sophisticated attack, by the way, if you, haven't, if you haven't got the details yet of what the Iranians did. It's changing calculations in the whole region, including in Israel. But so are the Saudis. So what, is, what does Trump say? Hey, they attacked them. They didn't attack us, right? Uh, you, we might help you, you know, fight, fight the, the problem here, but we're gonna, you're going to pay. You're going to pay for it. I mean, my God. Uh, uh, talk about a green eye shade president. Um, so the Saudis are obviously having laundry problems over this. Uh, it's been a double whammy. First it was Obama. That was bad enough. Then they thought they had the problem solved with Trump. Guess what, boys? Uh-uh. Quite the reverse. And so now they're doing a duck and cover drill. If you've been following the diplomacy and what the Saudis have been up to, they're doing a duck and cover drill. What do the Russians do? The Russians, you know, right on time, they stick in with an international um, security regime for the Gulf, a new regime that, of course, requires the United States to leave uh, its military footprint somewhere in Trotsky's dustbin of history. Fine, fine. Now, a couple of, a year or two ago, the Russians said, you know, Sergei Lavrov saying things like this, everybody would have, would have known that it was just propagandistic bullshit. Right? But now, with the Trump administration seeming to lunge for the exits, it doesn't seem that way to people. Okay? So what you've got here is a situation where just about every American ally in the world right now doesn't trust the reliability of the United States, and no adversary of the United States fears its power. That is a very dangerous situation, folks. That is a very dangerous situation. Uh, uh, I happen to think that the basic American grand strategy of the post-World War II period of providing common security goods to the world in order to obviate two things, uh, hegemons uh, coming into being in East Asia or Europe, uh, communist China back in the day, Soviet Union, that this was basically a prudent thing to do. It was an extension of American grand strategy from before the Second World War, only by dint of new methods, namely uh, forward deployment on the brackets of Eurasia. You all know, I think, these basic, these basic, but it was basically a good idea. It won the Cold War, not bad, then a problem arose. After the end of the Cold War, why do you keep doing this? There's still good reasons to do it, but it's not as, they're not as obvious. And we don't have, this is what Obama faced. We don't have anymore a single adversary, uh, an ideologically, you know, vivid uh, boogeyman like international communism in the Soviet Union. We now have sub and trans-state uh, threats to security as well as the old-fashioned state-to-state variety. It makes 
uh, the security environment much more uncertain. It makes hedging your bets as to where to put resources much more difficult to pull off. It totally scrambles the, whole, the way that the military and the, the political military organization of the U.S. government even thinks about these issues, which is nothing to be, you know, trifled with. And of course, the, Amer the American people think, especially after 2007, 2008, that we're in financial straits, so we can't afford to do this anymore. What we had there for a little while in American history and foreign policy was a concept of enlightened self-interest. A positive sum game, not a zero sum game, and it was very simple, right? And, and let, me, let me back it up and do it. Suppose the United States had not been providing common security goods for the past 30, 40, 50 years. I think most serious people in the United States would, would, would argue the world at this point would be a lot more dangerous. It, would, it will have been a lot more bloody. And for the United States to secure the amount of secure, security that it has, it would be paying twice or three times as much than it is now. $615 billion a year is not, is not chump change, don't get me wrong. It's a lot of money. But if you have three blue water navies, the stuff's expensive. And you have a volunteer force and so on and so forth. But, but I think the basic, the basic idea here is that this was the right thing to do. This kept the world more or less, this obviated hegemonic war, it kept a lot of regions of the world from going at one another. Because don't forget, American strategy during most of the Cold War wasn't just designed to deter Russian and Chinese uh, aggression. It was designed to keep our allies from slitting each other's throats from dimple to duodenum. The Greeks and the Turks are a good example in Europe. Look at Korea and Japan. The Korea, South Korea and Japan right now are having difficulties with one another, right? Had this been the Cold War, had this been a serious administration, this never would have happened. The U.S. government would have, would have stepped in and said, knock it off, guys. Knock it off. Trump, the Trump administration doesn't, doesn't do that. It doesn't care. As far as the Trump administration is concerned, they're just a bunch of free-riding allies. Right? Free-riding allies are actually not a bad thing if you, if you have an enlightened sense of your self-interest. Right? They're a bad thing if you have a zero-sum Randian sense of your self-interest. So that's the real difference with Trump. So not only does he not understand positive-sum games, he doesn't understand an enlightened self-interest. He, he doesn't know how to use power in a way that maintains the system. Don't forget, military power has three functions, not two. Most people can remember the two. Military power, in certain circumstances, can compel an adversary to do something that the adversary doesn't want to do. Second, military power can deter another country from... Uh, doing something that it might do that we don't want it to do. But most of the time, most military power, in conjunction with economic relationships and diplomacy and all the rest of it, most of the time, most military power neither compels nor deters, it just reassures. That's what the Seventh Fleet does in the Pacific Ocean. It just reassures. All right? you, you probably have heard the story that during the Gulf War, 2003, I think it must have been April or May 2003, it, through a mill mill channel, the Chinese called us up and said, when are you, go we, we'd taken the, all the carrier battle groups out of the Pacific and moved them toward the Gulf. When are you going to return that carrier battle group to the Pacific? We like it there, okay? Well, that just shows you, right? Um, Trump doesn't understand that. He doesn't get military power as, 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 a, form, as a form of, of, of a reassurance. He doesn't understand these things. He has, he has the mentality of a nine-year-old boy, as best I can make out. Now, and then there are other, you know, uh, recently, too, uh, there was a negotiation with the Taliban in Afghanistan that Zal Khalilzad was trying to, trying to bring to fruition. So at one point the president decides, well, let's going to invite the Taliban to Camp David. On September 11th, no less, John Bolton complained about this. You see where it got him. Now, a bomb went off in Kabul, and the president suddenly changed his mind and canceled the invitation uh, for the Taliban to come to, uh, to Camp David. But it doesn't make any difference. The, the image was already created. The damage was done. So in one theater after another, the credibility of the United States for constancy and for resoluteness and, and the, the, uh, the judicious use of its, own, of its own power, whether economic or military or political, has kind of gone down the proverbial toilet. That's the damage. That's the danger. And finally, the last thing I want to talk about is process. Now, when I teach courses on decision making, which I've done several universities, I just make two basic points to the students. One is, it's possible to think of a decision uh, in government as either a snapshot or a video. There's a, there's a utility to both ways of, to both metaphors. But by and large, it's the video way of thinking about a decision that's mo more useful. You figure out where, where the opportunity or where the necessity for the decision came from. You don't consider a decision as self-implementing. 
It has to be implemented. It has to be monitored. It has to be adjusted if things don't go the way you think they should. So it's better to think of a, a decision as a video rather than, than a snapshot. But the most important thing I try to get students to understand is that we like to think in a rational world. You know, we like to think that there's a relationship between the structure of the decision process, the structure of the decision making organization, right? The processes it uses to evaluate um, uh, alternatives, modalities, and so forth, and the outcome of the policy. We like to think that there's some relationship. We know that the relationship is imperfect. And the best example, I think, is, a, is in a classic book by Leslie Gelb and um, uh, Richard Betts called The Irony of Vietnam, The System Worked. And basically the argument of the book is that, yeah, the system worked. All the processes were fine. The, the, the structure was great and policy failed anyway. How do you explain that? I'm not going to get into that. You should read the book if you haven't. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. But uh, basically in American foreign policy, there's always been politics involved. From the very beginning, politics have mattered. But during the Cold War, there was a pretty strong consensus that went across the parties as that what we were doing, what the grand strategy was, was pretty much smart and that it was effective in any way that was necessary. And we had to, we had to um, be, you know, be intelligent about it, but that was the right idea. And you could almost forget that, that politics really made a big difference. Today, it's just the reverse. There's nothing you can understand about American foreign policy that doesn't start in domestic politics. Nothing. Uh, a lot of experts on American foreign policy abroad basically bracketed that for years. Can't bracket it anymore. Okay? You have to understand the politics of what's going on in order to understand the foreign policy outcomes. And, and this is a special kind of abnormality we're talking about here. Donald Trump is involved in uh, essentially a, a renegade effort at disintermediating the federal government. All right? That's why he tweets uh, his foreign policy out to the world and to his constituents. But in doing so, he bypasses the entire executive branch. He bypasses the entire you know, traditional media and all of the filters and, and all of the, you know, the guardrails in the media. Uh, it's, just, it's just totally disintermediated foreign policy. And of course, it changes like a weather vane. Right? Uh, it's not a coincidence either that there are so many acting heads of departments and agencies in the United States. Many of them in the defense area. We had, a, we had an acting Secretary of Defense during all these crises. We had an acting Secretary of Defense for, for months. All right? You may, may not realize this, but there are certain things that an acting Secretary of Defense can't do if he hasn't been uh, ratified by the Senate, can't do that a, that a real ratified Secretary of State, uh, Secretary of Defense can do. But even in the domestic realm, we have all these acting, we have all these mid-level mid uh, uh, Schedule C political appointment uh, positions of government that have never been filled. All right? This isn't just because the administration is slothful or can't find anybody. This is quite deliberate. It's designed to, to, to cripple the federal government at the knees. You know, Ronald Reagan used to say a long time ago, uh, it was a stump speech, right, that, that, you know, government is not the solution. Government is the problem. And he got a lot of votes saying that, you know, among, among conservatives. But Ronald Reagan didn't really believe that. If he really believed that, then the federal government would have shrunk dramatically under his two-term presidency, and it didn't. Donald Trump, on the other hand, actually believes it, right? And then, just to finish, uh, if you've been listening to Trump, and especially to Steve Miller, talk about the impeachment stuff, the impeachment dynamics, talk about a shit show, that are going on right now, uh, Miller has made a special, especially strong case of indicting the so-called deep state, all right? Uh, uh, trying to get, you know, it's a conspiracy theory kind of thing. Well, if there is no deep state, well, there maybe there has become one, um, you know, in the past year or two, but there is no deep state. Uh, let me tell you a story to give you an idea of just how weird this is. I mean, it's not just that Donald Trump doesn't trust government. He specifically thinks that the intelligence communities, which includes the FBI, of course, um, is basically a, 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 like a, it's like seven days in May. It's a television, it's like a, he's a reality TV president. I mean, his sense of reality from what's television and what's real life is very blurry, as best I can make out. He actually thinks all this stuff is real, all right? He doesn't read. He only watches. He reminds me of Chauncey Gardner, you know, and, and being there, you know, that movie, but never mind. Um, though not as nice, and he won't walk on water either at the end. Uh, uh, the, Mike Rogers was, until April a year ago, he was the head of the National Security Agency, right? So a couple of weeks before he retired, uh, he told me a story, right? He said, uh, in, I think it was February of 2017, just a month or so after the inauguration, he was in the Oval Office with the President and a couple of other, you know, types, hangers-on, and he showed the President unredacted intelligence 
sig signal intelligence, proving that the Russians, from a very high level, had directed uh, interference in the American election in, in, in uh, November 2016. Now, that didn't, that's not the same thing as saying that the Trump campaign was colluding with Russia. Those are two different things. One does not require the other. Uh, in the beginning, when the, all this stuff started to come out back, back, I never believed for a minute that the, that the, 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 that the Russians and the Trump uh, campaign were actually actively colluding with one another. And the reason was because the, the Russians would never be so stupid to trust amateurs like that. It, it's just, it was unthinkable to me. That's not their tradecraft, right? Uh, but, but, the, uh, but the hacking, I was sure. I mean, they, they did it before to other countries. We've interfered in lots of other countries' elections over the years, not lately, but... So th this was perfectly, perfectly sensible. So uh, Mike Rogers shows the president these unredacted, uh, you know, SIGINT intelligence, and the president looks at them, and he pauses for a second, and then he says to uh, Admiral Rogers, well, I have another view. I have another view? So, you know, I mean, I wasn't in the room. He was. Admiral Rogers, you know, says thanks and, you know, and bye. And, and all the way back in the limo, all the way back in the car to Fort Meade, he's trying to figure out what the hell does that mean? Dawned on him eventually, right? He actually, Admiral Rogers concluded that the president thought that he had handed him fake documents. Not real unredacted intelligence from NSA, but fake documents. That is how deep in the president's mind this conspiracy idea of the deep state goes. That, that his director of the NSA is standing right in front of him and thinks he's, he thinks he's trying to, to bullshit him. That's what, he, that's, that's what I mean by abnormal. Okay? So between the failure to understand the uses, the, 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 the prudential and judicious uses of American power, the failure to, to use diplomacy when it needs to be used, and the complete destruction of the foreign policy process that connects structure and process to outcomes, we have the most abnormal, strange, and in my view, potentially dangerous administration uh, since the Second World War, and possibly ever. So that's what's wrong with the Trump foreign policy. That's what's wrong with it. Not that it doesn't respect international norms and, and the United Nations Security Council and the so-called international consensus. Thank you.